Um, uh, today we're going to be covering some of the more advanced uh, sections of Python and applications or, or the usage of Python in general. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Let's let's open up with the slides and we'll get on with it. Uh, right. uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Scott. Oh, no, sorry about that. Uh, slides are good, yes? Yeah. Um, so before we get started, uh, the instructors really will quickly introduce themselves once more. Hello, my name is Sahas Poyakar. I am a CS major, and um, I am also the CS lead for UCRUAS. And today I'm joined by Scott. Uh, Scott, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Sahas. So yeah, I'm Scott. I'm a second year computer science major, and I'm the computer vision lead for UCRUAS, as well as uh, one of the instructors for this uh, workshop. All right, hello everyone. My name is Peng Chi, and I'm the business operations lead at Amaneo Systems. We're happy to bring this Python workshop to y'all in collaboration with MIS Society. And yeah, I hope you guys will take away from this workshop and have fun coding. All right, thank you very much, Ping Chi, and let's get started. So the very first topic that we want to discuss today is Boolean algebra and how it applies to uh, Python programming. So Boolean algebra is just a combination of multiple Booleans that use a different kind of logic statements in order to come up with either a true or false result. So we covered Boolean algebra uh, before, or rather, Boolean data types before, which are just true or false statements. And those are can be applied in different ways to produce furthermore true and false combinations by using some kind of some logic statements such as the not, the and, and the or. Uh, so we can quickly cover how not works. So not is the reverse of an existing value. So uh, in, the, in the last session, we covered double equal signs being used as a comparison operator. Uh, so uh, it'll produce a true statement when the two values being compared are equivalent to one another. While the not operator can be used to do the exact opposite, which will, which means it'll produce a true statement, uh, a true output, if the two compared variables are not equal to one another. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like in an example code. So uh, we're gonna quickly open up a new Python file and we're gonna create a variable called a and we're gonna assign that the number 10. And then we're gonna create a variable b and assign that the, uh, the value five. So traditionally, if we were to print out a double equal sign b, we would find that to be, uh, that would return false because 10 is not equivalent to five. But if in order to do a not operator, we would replace the first equal sign with an exclamation point, and that will turn this into A is not equivalent to B. And if this statement is true, then that will, it'll produce, it'll output a true statement. And if we set B to 10 and continue to keep A not equal to B, well, this will result in an output of false because 10 is equivalent to 10, and this would make the not operator turn that into a false statement. And by itself, the not operator can turn a true value into a false value and a false value into a true value. And an example of this, we can turn A to store a Boolean value of true. And if we do not A, which is as if we print out not A, which is just done by exclamation point A, this will just reverse the statement, oh, um, my bad. You would have to use the word, uh, the keyword not in this case in order to turn it into um, a false statement. And then, uh, and you can do this by, oh, just um, <laughs> and then that. if we had A set to false, it'll just return true because not false is true. So, 
uh, in order to use not, you'd either use the keyword not or use you would use the exclamation uh, mark. All right, let's take a look at the other two uh, Boolean algebraic symbols. So the next one is and, which uh, if we have two inputs that are either storing true or false, so we'll have a variable A with that stores true or false and a variable B that stores true or false. If both A and B store the Boolean value true, then if you did A and B, the output of that would be true. But if either one of them are false, so if we had A is true and B is false, A and B would output false. And the same thing for the opposite. If A was false, B was true, that would return false. And if both were false, then of course that would return, that would output false. So let's just quickly look at what that looks like in code. So if we had A is set to true and B is set to false, if we did A and B, we'll get false because B is the false statement in here. Both would need to be true in order to make this true. So if we change that to true, then we'll get a true being printed in our terminal. Cool. Uh, let's take a look at the final Boolean operator that we're going to be using, which is the OR, which works in similarity to and except only one of the inputs would need to be true in order for the output to be true. So if we had A set to true and B set to false, that would still produce a true if we did A or B because only one of them needs to be true to satisfy uh, an output, a true statement. But, uh, and then uh, it'll also be true if we just had A and B set to true, but, and then, uh, if both were false, if A was false and B was false, that would also return false, just like the AND statement. The only difference between AND and OR is that only one of them would need to be true in order for the output to be true for an OR statement. I don't know. It's like, no, that was sad, but. All right. Um, yeah, so let's just quickly see what that looks like in code. So we're gonna have, uh, let, let's set A to be true and B to be false. And if we did A or B, this will tr re return true because uh, we have one true statement coming from A. And then if we had both of them set to true, this would also return a true because if both of them are true statements, then A, a or B need to be true. And since they're both true, this would also return true. Um, any questions regarding Boolean algebra? Uh, if not, we can carry on to how we can apply this further on in something called control flow. Control flow is a way to enable us to run certain sections of a code um, based on a Boolean algebraic equation. So we use Boolean algebra to control the flow of our program and um, we do this by using if conditionals or else if conditionals and else conditionals. Right now, we're going to quickly cover what if the if conditional does. Uh, so if we had a Boolean algebra equation and had that return a true statement, any code that is executed underneath the if statement will run. And if that if condition was false, then that statement would be skipped and we would move on with the program as if that section did not exist. So let's just quickly take a look at what that looks like in terms of code. So what we'll just clear everything up and what we'll do is we're going to have a variable or we'll get an input from the user. So we'll store an input into a variable and we will ask the user for a number. And since inputs store stuff as strings, we would want to cast this into an integer so that, or sorry, we would want to, yeah, we would want to cast into it as an integer so that we can compare numbers together. So make sure if you're following along in VS Code, you cast this into an integer. And then we're going to do a simple comparison to see if the input that they chose was five. So if user input is, equivalent to five, so we'd use the double equal sign. And we would put a colon at the very end of our if statement. And this colon is 
just a way for Python to understand that, uh, that we are declaring an if statement here and all of the code that we put tabbed one over to the right falls underneath our if statement. So if this Boolean algebraic equation is true, then we want to just print out hello. And then we'll just quickly test this and we'll enter in the number five and it'll print out hello. And then let's just run this again and see what happens if we don't print out, uh, if we don't put in the number five. So if we put in 102 and ran the code, it wouldn't do anything at all because 102 is not equivalent to five. Therefore that it'll skip to the next line of code. Since there's no line of code to execute, we will just end the program. So if we did, for example, on line five print world, then, and then ran the code one more time, if we put in the number five, we'll print out the word hello, and then we'll move on to the next part of the code and print out world. But if we ran the code and put in a number that wasn't five, so let's say 10, then it'll just print out world because it'll skip out hello and move on to the next section. Any questions regarding control flow for if statements? Uh, yeah, so we had a question on how login screen works. So uh, this is kind of similar to how logins work. However, um, the text that a user puts in is put through encryption. So basically uh, it's encoded into a secret code so that, well, if someone breaks into the the files of the whatever company you're logging into it, uh, well, they can't really read it. It's just a jumbled mess in their point of view. Uh, yeah. All right, let's keep going on to the next section. Oh, is this like L if L statements in Java? Yeah, this is pretty similar to um, just general if statements uh, or any kind of conditional statements you might see in other programming languages. It's even similar to how it works in C++. It's tabbing, tabbing is a necessary piece for it to work in Python. So the tab basically will indicate that this line of code now falls underneath our if statement. If we were to, for example, put it out, we'll actually get a compilation error because we don't have anything that fits underneath our if statement. So the tab is an expected uh, requirement for Python to understand that this piece of code falls inside of our if statement. If you were to do this in C++ though, you can just use curly brackets to indicate whether something falls under an if statement, which is why the whole concept of Python using white space to, uh, for their coding is kind of weird because you need to make sure everything is tabbed the right amount for the actual piece of code to compile. So you don't, so we don't need to explicitly write else. Uh, we'll cover how elif and else works just right now. So let's move on to that section. So the whole, um, this is the whole block flow of a control flow code. So it can be structured using one if statement, one else statement, and as many elif statements as you want. So the if statement, as we covered earlier, will start a conditional statement block, and if that a boolean algebraic statement is true then it'll run the if it'll run the code underneath the if statement the elif is else if the first if statement above it or the elif statement above it was false it'll check the boolean statement for this so it'll follow an if statement if linked to the first or any other elifs and then we can have multiple elif conditional parts in the same control block and just like the if it'll run the boolean algebraic of run if the boolean algebraic statement is true and finally the else will end off our control flow code and will run only if all of the if and elifs above it were false this else statement does not require a boolean algebraic statement instead it is dependent on if the previous else and uh, sorry, if the previous ifs and elifs returned false. And just a note, if an elif, el, if an if elif else block, or in an if elif else block, only one conditional statement needs to produce a true statement to make that piece of code run, and it'll skip the rest of the stuff in the if elif else control flow block and move on with the code as if um, the rest didn't exist. 
So let's, show, let's see an example of what that looks like on the next slide. So right here, we have a simple control flow just that takes in an input from the user. And the first if statement checks if that value is equivalent to five. If it is, then we will just uh, print out to the terminal number is equal to five. Else, if the value is greater than five, we can, we'll just print out that the number is greater than five else. And this else is just assuming if five is not, if it's not equal to five or greater than five, then we're just assuming that it's less than five. And then we print out number is less than five. And the way that it'll look like is shown on the right with our control flow diagram, where we get the value as an input, and then we compare it against to see if it's equal to five. If that turns out to be true, then we print out the statement and move on to the rest of the code. If it's false, then we check the elif, and uh, we just keep checking until we find a true statement, and then we carry on with the rest of the code. Uh, does this control flow section makes sense in terms of what it's doing? Or are there any questions regarding this particular diagram? Also, uh, Kenneth, were we able to answer your question regarding um, the use cases of else? All right, cool. Why is the last one different from the others? Uh, which one, the else statement, Brandon? Um, so the else statement does not require an in, um, an algebraic equation like if and elif. The, the else statement will only run if um, the statements above it turned out to be false. Yeah, so as Peng she said, else is just catches all in case if it didn't work. And yeah, um, the hash input is less than five. It's just a comment, just to say, it's just to show that this else statement will run with the concept that it's trying to find any item that is less than five. And um, just, just another further note, just like how for if we put a colon at the end of our algebra, our, our Boolean um, algebraic statement, we also need to put a colon after the end of elif and the end of else to indicate that we are putting a certain amount of code underneath those specific blocks. All right, let's move on to um, loops. So the idea of loops are, let's say we want to run a piece of code over and over again for an indefinite amount of time. Well, we would use loops in order to achieve that so that we can repeat the same piece of code over and over again. And these guys also, so these loops also require algebraic statements uh, sorry, uh, Boolean algebraic statements in our run. Uh, while loop is actually a bit different, so we'll, sorry, for loops is a little bit different. So let's quickly cover how for loops work. So a for loop, um, one main uh, use case of for loops is they allow us to loop through lists, arrays, and strings. Uh, and what that basically means is, let's say we have an array with items one, two, three, four, and five. If we want to print out each item individually, what we can do is we can do for i in array. And what this means is we have our starting keyword for a for, which indicates we're using a for loop. We have an iterator, or in this case, a variable called i, which will store individual items from array. And that's what in array indicates. So uh, look, let's quickly take a look at the diagram on the right just to kind of visualize what's going on. So we're giving our for loop a array that is uh, that consists of items one, two, three, four, and five. And then we're gonna check first if we have reached the very last item in our array. If that isn't the case, then we will assign i the item, the first item in array and then we print out that current item and move on to the next item. So then now I will be looking at, the, or we'll be storing the second item in our array or our list. And then it's going to check if that item is the very last item, it, 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 which it isn't. So then we'll print out that item, which is two, and then go on to the next item. And I'll keep doing that and looping through until it has printed out all the items. Once it's finished printing out the last item, it now realizes it's at the end of the list, and then it'll break out of the loop 
and move on to the rest of the code. So let's just see what that looks like in terms of uh, programming. So let's go ahead and yeah, clean everything up and we're gonna create an array um, and we're gonna make it store a list of items, one, two, three, four, and five. And then we're going to create the for loop for i, which is the variable that will be storing all of our items in array. And notice how just like if statements, elif statements, and else statements, we have a colon at the end of a for loop and we will tab in to indicate all the code that will fit underneath our for loop. And that's gonna be constantly running over and over again until the loop is over. And then we're gonna print out i. So this will just print out one, two, three, four, and five with a new uh, on each new line. Another way to do this is by using something called the range uh, keyword function. Uh, what the range function does is it will pick, uh, it'll create a range from um, a num the starting number zero all the way to the indicated number and it'll set i to those numbers um, as the loop continues on and on and uh, just like how in, a pre in our previous lesson when we were printing out items in a list based on its index position we can just print out the arrays item based on what index position i is at so let's look at this step by step in code so right now what we're going to do is we're going to quickly clear out our, uh, the code and we're going to create a for loop uh, with our variable i and we're going to do in range this time and we're going to um, for now we'll just have a range be five so what this means is our loop is going to run five times and i is going to start at the number zero and it's going to go it's going to increment one by one to one two three four and it won't do five so it's exclusive so it goes from zero to five exclusively and then what we'll do is we'll just print out i, um, I and see what the numbers look like so we'll get zero one two three and four and this is very reminiscent of the indexing of our array because the indexing in array in our list, sorry, will start at index zero. So item one is index zero, item two is index one, and then so on and so forth, item five being at index four. So what we can go ahead and do is we'll first replace our range with um, the number five. We're gonna replace that with the length of our array. And we do that by running the length command function and we pass in the variable of our list. And then we, and now um, let's say if we added like another item into array that'll automatically get updated because of our length array function, which just prints out the array size. And then we, and since I will always start at zero and go all the way up to the size of the array exclusively, we can now use that to print out each item. Or right now we're just gonna demo what it looks like to print out um, just I, which indicates the index position. So we got um, all of the index positions, which corresponds to all of the items. So now we can replace the code to say array at position I, and this will print out all of the items in I. And we'll get the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six, because those are the items being stored in array. And just to make it, um, just to make it more clear, let's instead replace our numbers with letters to show that it's not just printing out numbers based on the size, but it's actually printing out the items in the in the array. So we're gonna give it like kind of a grocery list style of different string variables. And let's go ahead and print this out. So we'll print out eggs, bacon, milk, apples, new phone, and the number six, because those are the items that are being stored in our list. Just a quick recap, our um, lists in Python are able to hold multiple different data types. And in this case, we are storing strings, which are indicated by the quotation marks. And it's also storing the number six because on line three, we are appending an integer six into our list. So that's what's being stored in the very last position in our overall list. 
Um, any questions regarding for loops and how they kind of can be used to look through lists? All right, let's move on to uh, while loops. So while loops are a bit similar to for loops, but you would want to use a while loop when you don't know how long a program is, uh, you, uh, how many times you want to pro, uh, loop through the same piece of code over and over again. Unlike in lists, oh, sorry, in unlike in for loops, when we knew exactly how many items was, were inside of the list and we knew exactly how many times we wanted to run that piece of code. So it's uh, just a quick note, you would want to use for loops when you know how many times you want to run a loop and you'd want to use a while loop when you don't know how long. Uh, that piece of program is going to run for, and this is and the, the structure of a while loop is that it'll execute the code underneath it until the specified condition is broken, and that specific condition is indicated usually by uh, Boolean algebraic statements. So in this example, we have an array which has items one, two, three, four, and five, just like before, and then this time we have a variable i which is set to zero and this is going to act as our increment tracker and the reason we'd want to use an increment track tracker for while loops is because we need to find the right time to break outside of our while loop and this is done on line three when we have while i is less than the length of the array and uh, right now i is set to zero so zero is is less than the length of the array. So that Boolean algebraic statement will produce true and that'll allow the loop to run. And then we print out array at item zero or at index zero. So we'll print out the first item. And then what we do is we iterate our um, increment counter or tra tracker by one. And that's done in uh, the last line where it says i plus equals one and that plus equals is just a shortcut of just of saying i is equivalent to i plus one and th uh, this is just a way to increase the what i is currently storing by one so it'll turn zero to one one to two three to four so on and so forth and then we go back to the beginning of the while loop and check if our condition is still true so after we run the loop once i will be set to one is one less than the length of the the list which it is so it'll run the loop again and i'll keep running the loop until i is equal equal to five since five is not less than the array length uh, because five is not less than five it'll stop the loop and move on with the rest of the code so let's quickly take a look at what that looks like in the in vs code so we're going to create a new array uh, with the same items one, two, three, four, and five. And we're going to uh, also create our iterative counter. So we'll just have a variable called i and set that to zero. And then we'll have a while loop. So we'll uh, in indicate that by while. And then we're going to check if i is less than the length of our array. And then just like with for loops, we'll end it off with the colon and then we're going to write the code inside. So the first piece we're going to do is we're going to print out the uh, specific item in our array. So we'll put, uh, we'll print out array, square brackets, and then I. And then we want to increase I by one. So we do that by doing I plus equals one. So Let's run the code and see if that produces the same output that we got with the for loop, which it does. All right, cool. Um, now, a quick question to everyone in the meeting. What do you think will happen if we commented out line seven? If we got rid of that iterator, what will be the result of that, uh, of the code if we ran it? Peng Chi says crash. Um, well, yeah, eventually it'll crash. Yeah, it's going to turn into an infinite loop. The reason being is we don't it, we don't change the status of i. It'll always be set to zero, and since zero is always less than 
uh, this le the length of the array, which is five, is going to keep running on and on and printing out only the very first item in our array. So if this ever happens to you when you're writing code, the best way to break out of a infinite loop is by using control C or command C based on what kind of uh, OS you're running. Kenneth asks also, why did we have to declare i equals zero while the for loop didn't need it? Uh, that's because um, that iterator is required in terms of storing a variable. Um, so a while loop is going to be using a Boolean algebraic statement in order to determine whether it should run the loop. And one of the conditions for it is a variable essentially. So I needs to be declared beforehand, but with a for loop, um, let's quickly write out a for loop again, Scott. So for i in range five, what's going on is we are declaring our variable actually on line five as i, and it's being and it's being assigned based on what range is. So what in that in function does is essentially assigning a new number based on what the range is. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, cool. So then if we just print it out array i, it's just going to print out all the numbers. Does the loop have to run at least once? Um, not necessarily. If So if we had our while loop and we just said while i is less than array or the length of the array, since i is set to 100 right here, this just won't run because 100 is already greater than the length of the array, so it just won't run at all. And another example of this is since a Boolean algebraic statement will output a true or a false statement, if we just did while false, this basically is a useless piece of code because it won't do anything. A, a while loop only will run when it's a true statement. But if you already had the Boolean algebraic statement set to false, it's essentially just wasted space. But however, if we did change it to true, what do you think will happen? Yeah, it's, it's going to be a bit too useful because um, while true, it's uh, the Boolean algebraic statement is already defaulted to true. And since there's no way to essentially break out of that loop, then it's just going to keep printing that over and over again. But there is some important cases for this. Uh, hey, Scott, do you know how, wh why would we ever need to be using a infinite loop to ever run a program? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question, Saha. So uh, at first glance, an infinite while loop does seem kind of useless and or dangerous for your computer if you mess things up enough. However, um, there are a couple of things that make things very useful uh, when we're dealing with while loops that go infinitely or indefinitely. So if you think about any programs that run for a long time, so whether it's your, uh, your standard video game or your web browser or even your operating system on your computer, you want your computer to run until something happens. So until you close your window, until you close your uh, game, until you turn off your laptop. So how we do that is with a break statement. So as the name implies, when you use a break statement in any loop, so this can be with a while loop or a for loop, uh, if Python runs across the break keyword, then it immediately exits out of the loop that it's in and it goes to the next code. So in the example on the left here, we're printing i and we start at zero. And then if you see at the bottom, it says, if i is greater than three, then we break. So that means it'll print out zero, one, two, three. And then at that point, when we have i is plus equals one, we have i equals four. And then it's greater than three, so then it breaks. So it just continues. And speaking of continue, there's also a continue keyword in Python. So uh, what continue does in a loop is if Python comes across it, then it uh, immediately skips any of the code that hasn't been uh, working or that hasn't been gone over in, Py in that loop yet. And it goes to the next iteration. So in this case, 
uh, it says if i mod 2 is equal to 0, so basically if i is an even number, then we continue. So it doesn't even get to the print. So it, basically, this, for, uh, this while loop prints out only even numbers. Uh, yeah, so those are some really basic ways that we can use break and continue statements during a uh, any loop, but most importantly, during a uh, a loop that's working indefinitely. Yeah. Um, Elliot, the question: What is i equal to i less than one hundred? Oh, whoops. Uh, that is <laughs> called a syntax error. So it would be i equals one hundred or um, i equals zero and I is less than 100. Good I. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure to change that in the slides later on, the one, the copy that you guys have. Uh, any questions regarding the manipulations of loops? Oh, Nicholas, yeah, I was trying to type it in the terminal, but it wasn't letting me type. Okay, um, maybe during office hours, we can take a look at it and help you out if there's some something else that might be the issue. Have we said the keyword all day yet? I wanna get that extra credit. Mm. I, what was the <laughs> keyword for today? <laughs> Um, today's keyword is launchpad. Oh, cool. So today's keyword is launchpad, guys. All right. Thank you, Trang. All right, let's move on to the next and actually final slide that we have to cover today. And this is the, I, I would say, one of the more meteor sections of our Python workshop, which is functions. Functions is a really large part of what makes programming really powerful. So the idea of functions is that a function will usually take in an input, it'll manipulate that data depending on what kind of code we gave it, and then it'll spit out a return statement as an output. And this basically allows a programmer to take a bunch of code that uh, that they can use for algorithms or whatnot. And they will use that and put that inside of a function so that they can use that function whenever they want without having to retype the same section of code. So if you ever see yourself when you're writing a program, for example, uh, writing maybe like the same couple of lines over and over again, that's usually a good indication that it would be best to write that as a function. So the idea of functions is that in the first example, that we have on the right hand side, we will be passing in a list and a uh, and the function will print out each item of our list. So instead of having a for loop, instead of writing the same for loop over and over again to print out a list, we can instead create a function to do that for us. And the way that we write functions in Python is first we use the keyword def, which will define our function. And then we follow it with the name of our function, which follows a similar syntax to our naming variables, where we have to make sure we use the right lettering and we don't use special characters and make sure we don't have spaces in between any words. So in this case, we use underscores to fill in the spot for spaces. And then we follow it with parentheses. And the parentheses are super important because they are what we use to pass in parameters for our function. So when we were using the print function and the input function, those always had parentheses at the end of them. And we usually gave them, for example, a string as a way to print to the terminal. Those are functions and the parameter is what you give it to write to the terminal. In this case, we have a function called print full list and inside of its parentheses, it has the variable X. And that variable will store the list or, um, that we give it, and it'll run inside of a for loop i in x, which basically just means um, it'll print out all the, or I will store all the items individually in our list and print them one by one. Uh, there is a bit of a special piece of code that we have next to the print statement, 
uh, where it says print i comma end equals and then just an empty string. What that end equals empty string does is typically whenever you have a print statement, um, that um, after it prints out all of the words that you gave it, it will uh, just create a new line. And then if you print it another thing again, it will print that new piece of line on a new line of uh, on a new line in the terminal. But if you used end equals and then the empty space, what it'll do is instead of ending off the text with a new line character, it'll instead replace it with whatever that end equals is. And in this case, it's just a blank, uh, a blank space. So uh, if we, for example, had the um, items in the list that were dog, cat, uh, banana, instead of printing dog, cat, banana on, uh, on different lines, it'll print them in the same line with the space in between all of them. And then we just do print uh, an empty print to do a, uh, new line character, which means we just go to a new line after this function runs. And then uh, in order to use that function, uh, we'll actually do that in, uh, in in VS Code and demonstrate how to construct our function and run it. So let's head on to VS Code right now. And we're going to step-by-step show you how to create a function. So we'll first use DEF. And then we're going to create print and we're going to create a function called print array or print list actually, because technically they're called lists in Python. And then we're gonna give it a parameter. And this parameter is essentially um, how you give this function information and it'll store that information into that particular variable. And we can manipulate that variable by printing it out everything from the list. So we'll just do for i in user list and then we'll print out i. And um, yeah, and then what we'll go ahead and do is we will just, um, we'll, we'll create a list. So we'll create a new variable that stores our list. And we'll just give it a few items. And once we created our list, we will take that variable that stores our list and we'll give it to our function. So okay. we'll do print list, and then we give the parameter, which is user list. Now, if we use this, this is actually going to give us an error because user list isn't defined as a variable that contains any kind of information. User list is actually the variable that the definition uses in order to store the data that it got as a parameter. Instead, what we'll have to do is we're gonna to have to pass in a VAR variable. That's what contains all of the items of our list. And that's what we're gonna be using to give to user list in order to print out. So let's replace user list with var. And now this function will run as expected and print out all the items in our list. This example of a function just requires an input and doesn't actually return anything. Now let's quickly show you what it looks like to create a function that does have a proper input and a proper output. Uh, Ellie has a question. Does print underscore list var have to go, af go after the def print list? Yeah. So if we were to go back to our code and we didn't run the code at all, uh, oh, were you asking if you had to do it before or after? My bad. Okay, so the reason why this happens is because Python run uh, compiles code line by line, as opposed to for C++, all of the code is pre-compiled and you can have it basically execute code in any order. So what's happening is when Python first sees the first line of code, which is print underscore list var, both var and the definition for print list hasn't been stored in the compiler for Python yet. So none of those things actually exist. Does var, the var could be anything, right? Does Apple work? Yeah, so if we change the name var to Apple, it'll work just the same because Apple is just a variable name. 
So is DEF the equivalent of void in other languages? Um, no, DEF in Python is just a way to define our function. So we're gonna qu uh, quickly show you an example of how DEF can be used also with return statements. Uh, can we also change it to user underscore list? Um, can we, what do you mean yeah, by can we? Can. Oh yeah. Uh, oops, oh, I didn't mean to click that. Oops. Oh, nice job. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, but yeah, you can use user underscore list. The reason for this is because user underscore list is, um, so this is something called scope of the program. So user underscore list is known as a global variable while the user underscore list in our function is a local. And since they're given the same name, it's a bit confusing, but what's happening is the user underscore list, which is a global variable, is being passed into user underscore list, which um, in the print list function, which is a local variable, and they are technically independent from one another. All it's doing is it's taking the data from the global variable and giving it to the local variable. Uh, does that kind of cover it, Ellie? All right, cool. So now we're going to create a function that does have a return statement. So we're going to create a equation, or actually let's do the rectangle example. Yeah, so we're going to create a function called rectangle area, and it's going to have a width variable and a height variable. So the, these are our parameters, and then we're just going to create a variable called answer. <clears throat> and it's going to equal width times height. And then we, we will return our variable answer. So in this case, we do have a return statement and this return statement is most likely gonna be an integer or a float. So DEF does not define what kind of return statement we'll, we're gonna have. Technically in a Python function, we can have anything being returned. So now if we were to call our rectangle area function and we would need to give it two variables being um, width and height. So in this example, let's just see what happens if we didn't give it any inputs. So if we removed five comma four and we just did rectangle underscore area, we'll get an area, uh, sorry, we'll get an error because we're missing two uh, arguments. We're missing a width argument and a height argument. So. Uh, it's always important to make sure when you're creating functions you would and using your functions you've created, you give it the appropriate inputs in the parentheses so that it can take that data and manipulate it however that function works. And you'd also want to make sure that you're using the appropriate data types. So width and height will probably need to require an integer or a float. If it took in a string, it'll probably break. So if we did uh, five comma four, we're gonna get our answer and return the answer, but nothing's gonna happen because our return statement actually has to go somewhere. So when we return answer, instead of, instead of printing answer, it's going to be taking that data and replacing the entire line rectangle underscore area five comma four with the answer. So in order to actually store that information, you're gonna to need to create a variable and assign that to the variable. So we're gonna create a variable called area and then it's gonna store whatever result comes from rectangle underscore area and then convert and then put that into our variable area and then we print that out. And in this case, we get 20. And just to further understand how our, how local versus global works, if we were to try to just print answer so if we replaced area with answer, this wouldn't work because the scope of answer does not exist globally. It only exists within the statement or within our function of rectangle underscore area. Uh, any questions regarding, uh, regarding functions? Um, in the function, can I print after I return answer? Uh, so, so you wouldn't actually be able to do this because answer does not exist after you return it. Once a return statement uh, is met or found within a function, it'll just immediately stop and 
uh, and it'll essentially erase the existence of the variable answer. Is there a way to explicitly state the return type after a function? Um, that is a good question. Scott, do you know if that's a thing you can uh, do in yeah, Python? So you can specify. Um, so Python does have a way to um, write something so that you can tell other programmers or yourself what you intend to um, return as your function. But unlike C++, uh, you're not exactly locked into that. So uh, yeah, that's another thing with Python where it's a lot more convenient than older languages like C++, but you do have to be more careful in uh, how you're writing things just so you don't have anything uh, being input or output incorrectly. Yeah, that was a good question though. Mm -hmm. All right, there's just a few more things we want to kind of cover over in the slides, but we are just about towards the end. Oh, Ro has a question really quick. Does the order of declaration and calling matter in Python? Yes, it does matter in Python. So you would need to declare the function prior to actually calling the function. So if you try to call a function before Python has reached the definition of a function, it wouldn't work because Python doesn't know what that function is supposed to do. Yeah, this will give us an error because printer does not ex the function printer doesn't exist yet. Excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's quickly head back to slides and we'll start to wrap stuff up. So as we explained, or, or can you take us back one sec? Or Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, functions can have return values. Uh, they don't necessarily need to have return values as you saw earlier with our, um, with printing out the items in the list, we were able to just print out uh, stuff without having a return statement explicitly given. And, but the reason we want to do return statements is that we want to give a assign a variable, the solution that our function produces. So, uh, um, so like in the case of example two on the slide, this will assign a foo, the result returning result of triple underscore number. And then we can print out foo instead of just uh, relying on the function to print out the result. And this is nice because it, you not necessarily always do you need to print out the solution of a function. You would want to maybe use a function to maybe change some data around and then take that variable and then put that into another function later on. And the use cases of functions are for writing algorithms. They're also used for formatting print statements. So you can use them for creating like menu systems. And they're also super useful in terms of object-oriented programming. So our workshop will not be covering object-oriented programming, unfortunately, but if this is something that you guys would want to like maybe see in a future workshop, please let us know. Uh, but yeah, that is the end of our session two. So uh, let's move on to some of the conclusion, concluding statements for today's workshop. So we have our, uh, we, we have Trang over here in our Zoom call, who's going to kind of cover some of the material and our conclusion. Trang, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Trang, and I am the operations specialist for UCR UAS. Um, the class is officially over. Don't forget to sign in. Uh, it will help us a lot to make these workshops better for everyone in the future. Um, not just for the rest of the sessions, but for future workshops that we're going to host, like maybe GitHub or SolidWorks, whatever you would like. So don't forget to sign in. Um, a quick word from our sponsors, <clears throat> I mean our organizers. Um, so we are Unmet Area Systems at UC Riverside. We are a multidisciplinary student-led project specializing in building autonomous flight vehicle solutions. And our mission is to inspire, educate, and innovate. So. We build planes, which is innovating. We inspire everyone to like our planes and we educate, which is what we're doing right now. Um, recently, we had a flight test at the Polaris, uh, which, is, which has been successful. You guys can check out the YouTube video in the slides. Um, yeah, and let's go on. <laughs> 
so currently we need um, a little help. We are looking for students, UCR students, um, to join our team for both departments, engineering and business. So we're recruiting mechanical engineers, um, outreach, marketing and finance specialists and electrical engineers who, you know, if you find this Python workshop useful, if you're confident in your C++, Python or coding skills, then feel free to apply on our website or contact uh, Pengchi and Kenneth. I think their um, emails are linked in the slides as well. Also, if you enjoyed our workshop, consider supporting us um, by donating to our GoFundMe because we're going to a competition in Maryland in June of 2021. And we need, well, like the plane says, we need money to fly for all of our expenses, including operating expenses for future events. Um, in the works, we're planning more workshops just like this, covering any topic that you guys would like. We're thinking of um, making educational videos, just like, um, you know, a crash course. And we are also thinking of hosting an aerospace conference for next quarter. So that's going to be very big. Support us. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Don't forget thanks. to sign in. And thank you for being here. Really, thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Office hours are right now, by the way. If oh, yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs> awesome. mm -hmm. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and we can start with the office hours. Oh, don't forget the keyword is launchpad. My bad. The keyword is launchpad. Okay, officially ending recording. <laughs> officially <now>. ending. <laughs> <laughs>